right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us in the second of Chaser um, in-depth video conversations with a leading expert on issues of relevance for the British Army and Defence. Obviously, these discussions capture the views of two academics or experts, not any institution. And today we wanted to speak about the question or the phenomenon of global jihad. Um, it has been with us for a few decades now. It has evolved, it has changed, um, it has adopted into its context. Um, like lastly, ISIS has been an important conversation for many of us here in the UK and wider Europe and our allies in NATO. Um, but this phenomenon goes back a few decades. Um, and today we have an, a leading expert on global jihad studies um, who has done some groundbreaking um, studies on this conversation and approaching mostly from a social scientific perspective. And that's an important point to highlight because there's always been a tendency to understand the emergence of global jihad from a narrative analysis point of view or merely a theological perspective, looking for answers behind why such individuals groups emerged, how they were evolved and responded to conflicts from a theological perspective of Islam or theology or traditions. But Thomas Hedgehammer, who's, um, who's our guest today, um, has approached this from a very different perspective. And his latest book, The Caravan, focuses on a phenomenal individual named Abdullah Hazam, who played an extremely important role in emergence of global jihad in the 80s and mobilized. And in fact, he's been taught to have um, taught um, um, bin Osama bin Laden while he was a young student. Um, Thomas, um, let's go back to you. Um, you named Abdullah Azam uh, Forrest Gump or Global Jihad. And I think that's quite a brilliant capture of how he popped up in the most important moments of the emergence of jihad as we understand it today. Why did you write this book? And what do you think are some of the major contributions of narrating the story of global jihad through this figure um, has for today? Thank you very much, Zia, for that kind of introduction. And thanks for having me on. Um, so, yes, I, I wrote this book to understand where the jihadi movement comes from. Uh, because we're, we're all very familiar with uh, the recent history of Al-Qaeda, ISIS and all that, but we haven't really understood where it all came from. Um, and to do so, we have to look at the 1980s uh, and the so-called Afghan jihad between the Afghan Mujahideen and the Soviet Union. Uh, and that sort of birth phase of the movement hadn't sort of been studied in depth. Uh, and so, that, so what I wanted to do was to, to look at that kind of birth phase and try and re reverse engineer the, the, the emergence of the international jihadi movement. And uh, I focus on an individual named Abdullah Azam, who is the sort of godfather of the jihadi movement. It was he who led the mobilization of Afghan Arabs, the, the foreign fighters to the Afghan jihad. Uh, and he has exercised an extraordinary influence on the movement. He's not very well known in the West because he died early. He was assassinated in 1989. But in the Islamist world, he is a superstar. I mean, there are you go online now and there are you know, thousands upon thousands of memes with his picture. There are street, there's a street named after him in Istanbul. There are 10 mosques around the region. He's, he's a superstar and he's sort of the, the, the Che Guevara of the jihadi movement. But his, his life story hadn't been told um, properly before. This is, sort of, this is the first biography of him. And I kind of use his life to, as a prism to, to shed light on the processes that led to the emergence of the Jihadi movement. And, and it's really interesting actually, Thomas, to think about how clearly his own personal story of being um, from Palestine, being a refugee, moving to Jordan, being kicked out of Jordan, heading to Egypt and Saudi Arabia, um, exposure to violence and how he mobilized, traveled internationally, which today's jihadis are not necessarily able to do as freely as that generation do. It raises a lot of unique questions on what we observe in that generation, if you like the forefathers of the global jihad, versus the generation of foreign fighters that we have seen um, with ISIS in, in, you know, in, in 2000s. Even Al-Qaeda was a bit different between ISIS and, uh, and uh, Abdullah Azam's generation. What are some interesting continuities and discontinuities you see between that generation and how this movement eventually evolved from um, people like Azam? Right. So um, the so-called Afghan Arabs, the, 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 the foreign fighters in the 1980s Afghan Jihad, are in many ways similar to later 
generations of foreign fighters, be that in Bosnia in the 90s, Chechnya in the, in the late 90s, or Iraq in the 2000s, or Syria in the 2010s, they are united in, in that um, they are most often uh, motivated by you know the idea that there is a they have a religious duty to def to help other Muslims, so altruism basically. Um, they they are they are all they all share a kind of a worldview in which the all Muslims are one people, uh, and that if any Muslims anywhere in the world are under attack or occupation, then all other Muslims have a solidary responsibility to help them. Uh, if by by going there to fight, if need be, and that idea, the sort of military solidary responsibility was Azam's, and he articulated this in the in the mid 1980s, and it has been the kind of the the, the main sort of ideological justification for foreign fighters right up to the present day. However, there are also some differences, and very simply put, it's it is that the early foreign fighters were kind of less radical than the later ones. They were less willing to use uh, extreme tactics like uh, you know decapitations of prisoners or um, uh, suicide bombings against uh, civilian targets in the their area of operation. Also, even though you know, most foreign fighters in the later years, uh, they, they were not, even though they were not international terrorists as such, I mean, that's why, that, that's what defines a foreign fighter, is, is, is that someone who joins a conflict zone to fight there, and as, as opposed to carrying out an operation in his home country. Even, even though they, you know, they were focused on sort of fighting sort of semi-conventionally in conflict zones, the, the later foreign fighters have tended to, to be more kind of open to the idea of international terrorist attacks. Mm. So you find, for example, in the Syria war in the 2010s, many of the ISIS volunteers you know, in Syria would be supportive of terrorist attacks in Europe. Whereas in the, that was not the case in the 1980s. There, there was this idea that, you know, it was meaningful to carry out bombings in you know, out of, out of theater attacks, you know, be it in Moscow or somewhere else, uh, wasn't really on the table. Nobody considered that and there was no kind of, you know, no demand for it. And, and everybody took for granted that they had come to fight on the Afghan battlefield against enemies in uniform, you know, following sort of the, the Islamic laws of war. So in that sense, the, the, the early uh, Afghan, the, the early foreign fighters were, were less radical than the later ones. In fact, um, when we compare the sort of the, the, the tactics and the modus operandi of the Afghan Arabs in the 1980s, they were actually less radical in their tactics than some of the Afghan Mujahideen. Um, the Afghan Mujahideen in the 1980s carried out a lot of you know, controversial types of operations. Um, you know, they, they were basically terrorist attacks against, against civilians in Kabul, um, uh, there, there was horrific treatment of some uh, prisoners of war, decapitations, torture, etc. Uh, that sort of thing we, 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 the, the Arabs did not do at the time. And this is interesting because nowadays we think of foreign fighters as always the most radical. They're always a radicalizing influence in the conflict zone that they are joining. Uh, they're usually more radical than the local insurgency uh, that they're being hosted by. But in the 1980s, it was the other way around. The Afghan Mujahideen was a bit more um, uh, radical in their tactics than the foreign fighters. Um, when we take this historical approach, I mean, it is really helpful to see subtleties, evolving appeals of jihad, evolving theaters and their modus operandi. But it seems to me, Thomas, reading some of your work throughout the years, there are certain things that have remained constant. For example, a narrative of victimhood of Muslims or that particular victim in that particular Muslim locality um, and the personal outlook or profiles of individuals, some sort of revolution seeking 
um, if you like, get PA jihadis who are there for adventure or for grievance, or they themselves have suffered within their local conditions. They come from a failed state or failing states, or they're refugees, or they witness violence. Um, so thinking about these type of profiles um, and reflecting on the fact that what we have seen in, in this phase that we are in now in fight against ISIS in Syria, we have obviously thousands of militants in, in, in various um, uh, facilities in, in Syria, around the region waiting, and a whole generation of um, people that, are, that have witnessed um, fight. And again, similar narratives of victimhood, um, undertaking a revolution um, to restore some sort of caliphate, um, perfect moment, seems to be still working. I mean, is it fair to say um, that that aspect of the appeal of the narrative, victimhood and the need for a revolution, and the personal outlook of the individuals who are attracted to this revolution remains a cost constant, even though their modus operandi have evolved the last few decades? Yeah, certainly. I mean, there's, there's certainly some major themes, ideological themes that have remained constant since the 1980s. Um, and then, of course, there are also differences. The, the groups have evolved, the world has evolved, so they've had to adapt uh, to that. Um, but, th but there are some, I think, some, 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 some general sort of phenomena, which are probably linked to the fact that, you know, we're all humans at the end of the day, and the humans uh, kind of <laughs> uh, are, are wired just the same way today as they were in the 1980s. And uh, I'm thinking, for example, uh, about how kind of how mobilizations happen, that, for example, um, it's usually uh, network based, that people are, you know, radicalized and, and recruited into activism through people that they know in the real world as opposed to kind of just online. Um, it is that uh, people often join radical groups uh, for more than just the ideology. It's usually, uh, there are usually some more kind of proximate uh, factors and motivations involved. You mentioned some of them, sort of this, this quest for adventure or the excitement, the thrill of camaraderie. Many of the, actually, many of the same things that make our soldiers and our militaries volunteer. Um, people are after not so much, you know, people, people join the army not because they want to implement the foreign policy or whichever government is in place. Many people join because they, they like military life. They like the excitement and the thrill and the companionship of you know the fellow uh, soldiers. So I think so that's also important in re recruitment to you know rebel military organizations, including the most radical terrorist groups. So there are some you know I wouldn't I had hesitate to say universal, but there are some 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 some, some, some human and social factors here that that recur across time and space. Um, and if you and another factor is just the, the demographics of uh, jihadists. So the demographics of jihadists in the 80s is you know rough, it's roughly the same as the one today. It's mostly young men who go, people in their 20s, um, and uh, you also often have you know a fairly big variety of, of backgrounds. Uh, so yeah, th there there are. Um, continuities but also some some differences here um, and thomas one question which is very relevant for our discussions in the uk is um the borderline if you like which is very difficult to pin down between extremism as an ideology and when that ideology and extremism becomes a militant act in other words obviously there are so many people in within europe and globally who might have um, similar narrative, similar sense of victimhood um, and calls for a revolution, etc. But at what stage those kind of narratives and ideologies and, and personal beliefs translate into militant action? I think one fascinating insight from your work on uh, Abdullah Azam is that journey itself. I mean, here's a man who began with struggling with some of these questions theologically and then as well as kind of his political readings of the world. 
but impacted widely, actually, deeply by the socio-political milieu he's in. I mean, we, not just for him, even inside Qutub and even in Ali Shariati, in so many other intellectuals before him as well, who accommodated some of these things. You see the, um, the political philosophies of his days, revolutions and socialism and Marxism, pretty much coming in and sneaking in. Um, so reflecting on your work on Azam and looking at his journey, um, what do you think are the hallmarks or the kind of thresholds of that extremist ideology translating into participation into militancy or terrorism and how even Azam himself um, gradually could not necessarily maintain control of the, um, the genie he let out of the box. In other words, you preach all these extremist ideas, you call for help, you kind of accommodate violence, but then you attract people who are not really satisfied with the revolution you're delivering and they want more and they're attracted to a further league. So what are some insights we can gain from life of Azam and his teachings in this journey of extremism, militancy, and increasing to international terrorism and extreme forms of violence? Right. Well, I think one insight is that um, radicalization is a gradual process. That very often, usually, people don't wake just wake up one morning and decide uh, to join Al Qaeda or ISIS or, or to you know, you know. Yesterday I was out clubbing. Today I want to blow myself up. That's just not how it works. It's always uh, a gradual process, and you know, this is the famous sort of. You know, boiling the frog parable you know people say you know, if you if you want to boil a frog and you throw him right into the boiling boiling water he will jump out but if you put him into cold water and heat the water up gradually he will stay and get boiled so it's the same thing with radicalization and so with azam for example uh you can uh, sort of divide his evolution into stages where uh in the in the beginning, uh, he, he is kind of uh, focusing on, you know, pr provide, sort of preaching about um, Muslim suffering around the world and the need for, you know, Muslims to stand together. And then he's involved in sort of in more, um, and he gets directly involved in the Afghan jihad, but not so much militarily, but you know, as a diplomat, you know, as a as a as a propagandist, trying to raise public awareness across the Muslim world about the Afghan jihad, and then uh, at the from the from in this final phase, he starts calling on everybody to come and and fight there. Um, and then you could you could continue this chain of sort of uh, evolutionary steps. Um, by looking at you know Al Qaeda and and subsequent jihadi groups, because what what they what Al Qaeda, for example, comes along and does is to take the same sort of worldview. You know, the the, the, the Ummah, the Muslim nation, is under attack. Um, all Muslims have a duty to uh, defend against this external threat, and now we're going to defend the Muslim nation by attacking America, by attacking the West through terrorist attacks. So. You know, Al Qaeda takes you know the process a step further because Azam himself never advocated international terrorist attacks. He he just wanted people to come and fight in Afghanistan. Uh, but Bin Laden kind of takes it a step further and says, "Yeah, we're under attack. We need to do something." And fighting, you know, just fighting in conflict zones as foreign fighters is not sufficient. We need to also we need to attack the enemy, you know, in his home home base. So. I guess that's one one insight that you know these things usually happen happen gradually. But another sort of insight I think for today is that um, uh, that that because these things happen gradually, um, it's it's sometimes uh, difficult to know what to do. You know, with the sort of middle ground with things that are sort of semi-radical or you know semi-problematic um, and in some ways you know foreign fighting is sort of the least controversial or the least problematic you know type of you know jihadi violence because what foreign fighting is you know about is you know, leaving your country to fight in some in someone else's war, but you, f but to fight in that war, as a soldier or or, or a paramilitary, 
uh, and that uh, is, you know, in most people's eyes, something quite diff different from flying planes into buildings or uh, blowing yourself up in a in a mall, um, and um, because it also aligns with many sort of moral intuitions that everyone has. You know, if, if there's, for example, in Afghanistan, you know, the Afghan people really was suffering tremendously under Soviet occupation. And so that people that someone would want to go there and help the Afghans uh, by fighting is not mm -hmm. uh, mind-boggling. Uh, but the problem is that you know when we sympathize with the with the insurgencies uh, that are receiving foreign fighters then it becomes very delicate you know about you know what should we do about that and i think the Af afghan jihad is a is a sort of a lesson you know in the potential risks of allowing you know, war volunteers foreign fighters into a conflict um, because basically, by then what happened was that you know, you know, they, the the West, uh, at least west of the Berlin, west of the Iron Curtain, were, you know, fully supporting the Afghan jihad because uh, uh, they wanted to get the the Russians out, and, and many people also sympathized with the, the Afghan people. Uh, and because we supported their cause, we didn't mind, governments didn't mind people going there to fight. Mm -hmm. uh, it was only later that we realized it, the repercussions of this. We have a later example of sort of the same thing. In the start of the Syria war, um, there was widespread international you know, sympathy for the Syrian rebellion. And uh, it, what it meant in practice was that many of the people who traveled you know, as foreign fighters early, they didn't face many obstacles from governments. Governments didn't really stop them or put barriers in their in their way, because you know those same governments were supporting the insurgency, and so you know it was politically difficult or sensitive or costly to you know, uh, for you know say for example you know a country like Saudi Arabia to say to tell their people no no you can't go there and at all to Syria but. We still supported the rebellion, and you know, and and the same thing actually with the European countries. You know, many European countries were you know politically supportive of the rebellion, and so to you know crack down hard on people who were traveling there was was difficult. But then you know, the, the, in the case of Syria, it emerged very quickly that um, it was not a good idea to have foreign fighters uh, join. So I think as as a general rule. Uh, it is wise, you know, not to allow foreign fighting because it, it you, know, you can't control them. You know, it helps. They they undermine state, uh, the state monopoly of violence. And so, you know, if you really, you know, say, you know, if the UK in in, a, in the future sympathizes with, you know, a particular rebellion uh, somewhere, then they should send they should send British soldiers there. You know, as a you know in a formal you know, government intervention, not allow uh, war vol private war, war, war volunteers to join it. Um, uh, so I guess that's another takeaway that, you know, foreign fighting or, you know, just private war activities are usually a bad idea. Um, Thomas, thank you so much. I think I'm just really not doing justice to your book and your decades long scholarship on this. Um, it's a fascinating study drawing from first hand research papers. I wanted to ask you about Azam's, um, the famous story um, or the questions around who killed him and how that happened, but I'll leave that um, to the um, readers of your book. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching this. Thank you.